Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sandeep, uh, and uh, just really happy to be here. Happy to see all of you here. And uh, this will be a bit technical, but I'm assuming that most of you here would understand the technicalities of things. And I'll also try to make it a bit more non-technical by int introducing a few personal anecdotes as well. So, smartphones as we know it uh, play a huge role in our lives. Currently, there's anywhere between four to five billion photos being captured every single day on smartphones. And that's roughly around 1.7 to 2 trillion photos every single day. So that's how important a role smartphones play currently. So we'll be talking about the evolution of smartphone cameras. So I'd like to start by showcasing this particular photo. I'm not sure if any of you have seen this earlier, but this is the world's first smartphone photo. Now, it was not exactly a smartphone photo because this was taken in 1997 prior to smartphone cameras being introduced and invented. But Philip Kahn, the person who took it, took this photo of his daughter when she was born using a contraption of a smartphone, sorry, of a phone, of a camera as well as a laptop. So this basically photo was sent across the internet and it was also the first photo to be sent across the internet uh, and was named one of the 100 most influential photos in Time magazine. Now in order to understand our journey towards where we are, it's also important to see how far we have come. So here's an example of some of the photos that smartphones are capable of clicking these days, which otherwise would only be possible using digital cameras, the high and mirrorless or DSLR cameras for instance. So these are incredible images that if you look at the first image that was ever captured, you would not have thought as being possible. Now smartphone photography initially had a very simple formula. It just had hardware. Right? Of course there was a very basic software there, but it was just hardware that was the focus just giving the capability of being capture, uh, being able to capture images on this, right? Now, late 90s, that's when you started seeing camera phones. You also had implementations where there was an external uh, camera that's being attached to the phone. Up until the mid-2000s, you had several different implementations of it, especially in terms of form factors, uh, because the phones themselves were in its nascent stages, and people did not really know how it would progress and how actually you know, the future of smartphone photography was like. So they experimented with form factors, and this was, of course, pre touchscreen era. So there was a lot to be gained in terms of the capabilities of smartphones itself. Now, the other bit is also the image experience. The viewing experience was not great. While you could take photos, the screens on smartphones were often very, very small. Some of them even had black and white screens, and you could actually view them in color only when you transferred to your PC, or your laptop, or your TV. So here are some of the designs. Quite interesting, to be honest, if you look, there was a swivel design, there was a camera that was hidden inside a lipstick-shaped phone, you had a swivel on top, you had a video camera-focused phone. So all these phones sort of tried and experimented with various form factors. Uh, and if you look at the phones now, they all look very, very similar. And we'll talk about that also very soon. But this was the beginning of smartphone photography. Now, mid-2000s until 2010, this was a period where experimentation became a bit less. People started understanding, okay, it's the easiest probably to just have a camera at the back, and as long as you don't try and do different form factors, you also have more space to put more things in the phone, and also have more uh, higher megapixel count, you can also have higher sensor size, and this was also a period where you had megapixel wars, as we call it in the industry, because back then when you started, you had less than a megapixel on most phones, and VGA, QVGA, 1 megapixel, 2, 3, 5, 8, and finally, we sort of stopped at 12. So that era was quite interesting because this was also the time where I started my photography journey uh, with a smartphone camera. So smartphone definition has changed quite a bit now. I think back then people called it a smartphone, but it wasn't entirely smart. So a smartphone essentially became smart maybe from the 2010, which we shall talk about soon. But during this phase, what also we saw was the fact that considering digital cameras were still quite prevalent and people were buying digital cameras, smartphone manufacturers had to actually introduce some of the prosumer features, like a mechanical shutter, you had a dedicated shutter button, xenon flash, ND filter and stuff, which you typically see only on high-end mirrorless cameras or DSLRs. And this was done so that they could entice people to invest or buy a smartphone for photography and for their personal needs rather than investing in a separate phone and digital camera. Now, this period, we saw that the viewing 
got better because you had larger screens with higher resolution and color screens, but even then sharing was not great. In fact, what Philip Kahn did in 1997 was still not possible at this particular point of time. So uh, this, this point when I started my journey uh, was important because now when I look back at the photo in hindsight, it was not very great. But because I had the encouragement of my family and friends, I still continue capturing photos. So I would urge all of you out there that if you have any friends and uh, family who are doing photos or into photography, please do encourage them because I'm sure they will come a long way over the years. So here's a quick look at some of the other smartphones from this particular era. As you can see, there was a 5 megapixel camera phone with Xenon flash. You had a mechanical shutter. You had a you know, 12 megapixel phone, which was considered to be the end of the megapixel wars. Now, fast forward to 2010, and the formula sort of changed from just being hardware-based to software. So this is where software took an important leap, and we started introducing shareability as a feature. So until then, what happens is the only way to share it was to copy it to your PC or laptop, and then you would post it on the internet. But even social media was not really all that prevalent, which happened since 2010. Now, this is when you saw the end of the megapixel war. There were a few outliers where you had maybe a large megapixel count, but most of them focused on the software bit and had a resolution of anywhere between 8 to 12 megapixels. In terms of the uh, capabilities of the smartphone also it improved because social media was on the rise. You had Twitter, you had Instagram, you had Facebook, and people started sharing. In fact, what Philip Kahn did in 1997 became uh, such an easy process. You did not need a separate contraption. You had mobile data or you had Wi-Fi. If you take a photo, instantly share it. Within seconds, it would be up online and people would be able to see all your great photos. And that's when people started realizing, okay, this is probably the easiest way to capture photos and document my life and even tell people what I'm doing on a daily basis. So here were some of the smartphones. You can see the form factor that we had in the past uh, is gone now. It's become much more simple. In fact, even the camera shutters that were there that also went away because people wanted fast, easy access to photos as well. So if you miss a moment, that's a big thing in photography because timing is very crucial. So people did not want any sort of obstruction, even in terms of a physical shutter or any other form of mechanism. It slowed them down in the process of taking photos. So you just open the camera app and start shooting. And funnily enough, a, we, uh, a word of advice for people out there, this was the time when I got my first DSLR and that's how my a beautiful wife and I got talking and photography is I think a great tool to help break the ice you know so any of you guys out there if you're still interested in photography take that up I'm sure that yeah, you'll also get a girl very very soon. Then the formula sort of changed from just hardware and software to computation. Now computation is more recent and it's still an evolving process. Uh, this requires complex hardware which was available at the time. We had processors that were more powerful, and that's why computational photography started getting introduced, which meant that even with the smaller sensors, considering most smartphones have smaller sensors compared to traditional cameras, we were able to offset some of the issues, such as low light performance, such as fast shutter, all these things we were able to guarantee and get with computational photography. And we also saw the introduction of AI, which was in its very early stages and still is, and I'll talk about that very, very soon. But this was the beginning, beginning of AI photography as well. And here we again saw a significant rise in terms of the megapixel count. So earlier we had stopped at around 12, that went to 20, went to 48, went to 64, 108, and eventually we even have phones today with 200 megapixel resolution on their cameras. We also saw a rise in terms of the lenses or the cameras on the back of the phone because earlier there was just one single focal length, a wide angle camera and that's all you had. But that sort of changed. It became an ultra wide, you had a telephoto, you might have a portrait camera and several different cameras people started experimenting with in order to further satisfy the need of users considering social media was so, so prevalent at this time. So here's how it changed. So this was a 64 megapixel camera phone, then 108, um, both from Xiaomi. You also have a Google Pixel there which started computational photography as we know it. You also have a Nokia PureView here which again had five cameras at the back. So at this peak there were phones with seven cameras, phones with six cameras and they all serve different functions. Now since then there's also been a further refinement, a further change because in its pursuit of getting better and better photos 
and enabling people to take great uh, photography, uh, smartphone manufacturers decided, okay, we need to make it more and more like cameras. So how, how do you do that? What is the missing piece? And that was the feel. Because photography is not just about capturing photos in the final output, but it's about the process of it. Earlier, you used to have a tedious process when film cameras were there, you had to uh, roll the film, you had to develop it in a negative room, do all these things, but right now, you just click, point and click, it becomes easier. And in fact, even kids these days know how to take photos. However, this is something that sort of takes something away from photography, and that's why they're bringing back the feel of it by giving aspects such as a shutter button, or giving certain, certain aspects like leather on the back of smartphones. We also have a great focus coming on large sensor because it's basic physics. The larger your imaging sensor, the better the image quality will be. And also, compared to the smartphones of the past, in the previous generation, what you get now is more consistent and equal weightage being given on all cameras. So, because equal weightage is given even if you shoot on your ultra wide angle camera, if you shoot on your telephoto camera, or the wide camera, you get the same consistent, beautiful looking image, which previously was not there. So people used to shoot only with the primary camera because that is what gave them the best quality possible. We also have several new developments happening. We all saw macro lenses becoming more and more popular. And now there's something called a floating telephoto lens, a floating mechanism which is very similar to a DSLR. We have variable aperture lenses now coming onto smartphones, which was previously not possible because of the fact that smartphones were so small the space constraints did not allow it, but with technical advancements, we are now able to do all these things. So here are some of the current amazing smartphones when it comes to photography. Uh, they do provide almost every single person uh, with the ability to shoot incredible photos. One question I get asked quite often is when will smartphones replace DSLRs? I think this is not a very simple question to answer because it depends on various few factors. But the first question I want to ask you guys is when was the last time that you took out your camera? Or how many of you even have a camera right now? I'm sure that most in this room and even outside, uh, at least personally, would still prefer to use their smartphone camera. Professionally, there are people who still use dedicated cameras, like DSLRs or mirrorless cameras. But I still believe that the best camera is the one that you have on you. And this was said by Chase Jarvis, and he really meant it. And I do believe in the same as well. Because back in the day, I used to walk around with a 25 kilo backpack with two bodies, multiple lenses to just get the shot. But right now, all I need is just one smartphone in my pocket and it can do just as many functions, if not take better quality photos and is much faster as well. So back in the day, if you go 100 years prior to this, this is what cameras looked like. This was a large format camera which needed a tripod, which needed a longer exposure and you had to stop down because there was too much light coming in at any given point of time. And what that meant is you could not explore certain types of photography. You could only do photography that was still. There was no dynamism in photography at that point of time. And that's when the invention of the 35mm camera happened. So this changed photography for the better, for good. This basically allowed people to have a handheld photography experience. This is what we know as full frame photography right now. So 35mm camera, this is a Leica 1 around 1925 when, was when this was invented and this changed what we know as photography today because people could do street photography, they could do more dynamic photos, they could carry it around and a similar sort of movement is what is happening right now with smartphones. So, like I mentioned, it was not an easy process back in the day. It was a very complicated, tedious process. Setting up for photos meant that you had to spend anywhere between 5 to 10 minutes just setting it up and then several hours later to process the images before you were actually able to see something and even then the results compared to what we have today were not anywhere as good. So smartphones are now the new 35mm or full frame cameras, the equivalent of that because even with miniaturization, thanks to software, thanks to clever algorithms and advanced hardware, we're able to get impressive results that are actually better than what we saw even from DSLR or mirrorless cameras earlier on. Now, what is the future of smartphone cameras? I think this is something that most people are debating. Of course, while we will see several advancements in terms of the hardware, we'll see that the cameras are becoming more and more like DSLRs and mirrorless on smartphones. So, that is there, but what is the next big leap? And I believe that is AI. Now, this AI is different from what we have seen on smartphones so far. Currently, it uses anything to adjust a saturation, the contrast, or slight tweaks, and identifying what object or subject you have in your frame, 
But AI will change overall in the future with smartphones, considering it will allow you to go above and beyond all the hardware limitations. For example, based on your location, it will know what sort of light is hitting in. Based on your location, it will know the time and adjust the light intensity accordingly. All these things will help overcome the hardware limitations and photography itself as we know it will change considering there's a bit of artificial intelligence also happening there. Currently, that's not the case, but in a few years, we will see a huge change with this. Augmented reality is yet another thing. While it uses cameras as well to overlay things onto your screen, imagine having directions, right? Imagine you're currently looking at your maps while you're walking, it is distracting. But what if you had something that you were wearing and you could actually see uh, as you were passing by a restaurant, it would show you the rating then and there. It would also allow you to check the prices of things. So this is how cameras in the future will develop and will make your life a whole lot easier and simpler. Now, these are some of the photos that I took recently just to showcase how far camera phones have come in terms of capabilities. Now, if you look at the start of photography over 100 years ago with large format cameras, it, it really has come a long way. And I believe that you know the best days of photography are yet to come. While we have seen amazing changes, while we have seen amazing developments in the field of photography, not just in cameras, but even in, in terms of smartphones, I believe that we will still go even forward and there's a lot more to look for. Thank you.